Good morning. My name is Jake Kurtzer. Um, welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, for those of you watching online, welcome to CSAS Online. Um, and thanks again for joining us. Um, some of y'all were here yesterday for day one of our conference, but we're really excited to kick off the second day of the Sustaining Access Conference, um, talking about refining humanitarian principles, humanitarian practice, and humanitarian policy for today's humanitarian challenges. Um, we have a, a great day ahead of us, but I'm particularly excited about this morning's opening session. Um, yesterday at this conference, we talked a lot about um, uh, some countries where we're experiencing real access challenges, Ukraine, um, Afghanistan, uh, the Sahel, and we talked a little bit about some of the uh, broader strokes thematic issues, and one in particular, uh, the challenge of the ongoing existing counterterrorism regulations and bureaucratic impediments imposed by a counterterrorism framework. Within the context of that conversation, the key issue is how do humanitarians and the community around them engage with those groups that are designated as, as terrorist, um, and how do humanitarians engage with um, non-traditional or non-state armed groups. So we're really excited for this morning's opening session. We have um, one of the world's leading experts on the topic, and to introduce her, I want to invite up my colleague, um, Nicole Amdahl, to um, introduce and moderate our conversation. Good morning and welcome um, on behalf of uh, CSIS again to everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this very important conversation. My name is N Nicole uh, Breland Andal. Uh, for our Norwegian friends, yes, Andal Ness, Norway. That's not my home, but it's my last name. And um, I'm really pleased to um, introduce our speaker this morning, Lise Grand, who has 25 years in humanitarian and peacekeeping experience, and she was one of the most senior negotiators with the United Nations. Um, and what's really interesting is she did this work through 12 wars. So we are exceptionally pleased to have her here to give some opening remarks, and then we will have a discussion and some Q&A. So uh, welcome, Lise. Um, I'm delighted uh, to be here and to have been invited to be part of this discussion. What I'd like to do in my brief presentation this morning are two things. First of all, to chart some of the milestones in the evolution of humanitarian negotiations with non-state armed actors, and second, to reflect on the perils of these negotiations. To frame the conversation, it might be useful to begin with a working definition, it's used by most humanitarians of what a non-state armed group actually is. So, non-state armed groups are fighting forces with political or military influence, they are not states, and their levels of organization and leverage differ hugely. NSAGs range from small groups of armed men loosely formed in a militia, for example, in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, who raid villages and prey on travelers on isolated roads, to complex political religious movements, for example, in Yemen, like Ansarala, which control much of the country and population, function openly through state ministries and have formalized armed structures and armed forces of their own. The ICRC, which tracks NSAGs and monitors their actions, has identified more than 600 of these groups operating across the world. So humanitarians engage with NSAGs for one of three reasons. First, to reach and assist people in need, that's humanitarian access. Second, to protect and preserve humanitarian operations in a shared operating environment, that's humanitarian space, they're not the same thing. And third, to protect civilians and promote respect for international humanitarian law. During the past 25 years, humanitarian negotiations with NSAGs have fallen into four basic categories. The first type of negotiation took shape at the end of the Cold War 
They're known as negotiated access frameworks. These mechanisms are typically negotiated by the UN. They include all of the belligerent parties to a conflict, and they specifically define the role and posture of humanitarian actors. The aim of a negotiated access framework is to obtain broad, formal commitment to the components of a humanitarian operation. Those components, of course, would be assessment, delivery, coordination, monitoring, and if you're very lucky, accountability. The thing about an access framework, however, is that they do not usually include the specific modalities for each of these components. So how you assess is almost never included inside of an access framework. How you deliver aid, these are not specified. This has been one of the weaknesses of these frameworks. In some cases they do, but that's the exception. One of the earliest and most comprehensive and enduring access framework Operation Lifeline Sudan, known as OLS. This was a compact that was negotiated, in fact, before the Cold War ended. It was negotiated by Jim Grant from UNICEF during the devastating famine in the Bar Ghazal region of Sudan. It was signed. It was a formal agreement that was signed by the government of Sudan and by the non-state armed group, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement. The OLS framework had three elements. It defined the conditions and terms under which humanitarian action would occur in Sudan. Define those. Based on these conditions, these terms, belligerents promised to ensure unhindered access. So if the conditions and terms were in place, there was unhindered access. It did something else very interesting. It committed humanitarians to remain strictly neutral during the delivery of aid. It did not assume that humanitarians on their own would be neutral. I'm gonna pause there because obviously many humanitarians now insist that by definition, they are neutral. Negotiated access frameworks did not assume that. They specified the conditions under which that neutrality would be upheld. The OLS framework was amended several times during its 16 years of existence. There is no other access framework that has lasted longer. Each time that it was amended, the scope of humanitarian action was expanded. It eventually included coordination. It included accountability as components. And by the end of the 16 years, you actually did have modalities specified inside of the compact to prevent diversion and ensure that assistance was needs-based. Now, following a series of violations by the non-state armed group, that was the SPLM, this occurs in the mid-1990s, the UN negotiated and here's where the trouble begins, a separate formal agreement with the rebels. So you had one access framework that brought everybody together, and then the UN did something very curious. It said, actually what we're gonna do is negotiate a separate agreement with the non-state armed group. That was called the ground rules. From the start, they were controversial. Now, the ground rules had two aims when they were negotiated. There was an attempt to formally bind this non-state armed group to IHL. Second, the ground rules were meant to establish a structure for relations between aid agencies and the non-state armed group. And again, the difference here is in an access framework, those relations are contained for all belligerents in one agreement. What happens under the ground rules is that the UN says we're going to have a separate formal signed agreement with the non-state actor for the ground rules just for them. It was this second aspect that opened up a can of worms. During the negotiations, here's what the SPLM said. They said, you want us to uphold our obligations 
under IHL, we can't. We don't have the capacity to do that. So humanitarians, you want access to the areas we control? You give us direct material support in the form of administrative capacity building to do that. The humanitarian negotiators agreed. Now the government of Sudan was shocked by this development. And they argued direct administrative support enhances the overall effectiveness of this non-state armed group as a military body. And therefore, humanitarians, this violates your principle of neutrality. Now, there were parts of the humanitarian community and many within the UN who understood the risks associated with the ground rules. That said, they were not changed. And the UN ended up providing substantial material administrative support to the SPLM, a non-state armed group, for more than a decade. There was a second problem with the ground rules. This was unintended, but it had an incentivizing effect on other non-state armed groups, which said, we're not going to allow humanitarians into our areas unless the UN signs a separate agreement with us. Within a year, there was a splintering of the SPLM. A second ground rules had to be signed with this second SPLM group. And within three years, again, the SPLM had split, and you had a third ground rules. Although very difficult to manage and frequently criticized, as I said, Operation Lifeline Sudan lasted for 16 years until a comprehensive peace agreement was signed between the government of Sudan and the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in 20. Five. Now, throughout this period, OLS remained a center of gravity. Almost all humanitarian negotiations, excepting, of course, the ICRC, with non-state armed groups, and they kept proliferating, was done on the basis of the original OLS agreement, and then after 1995, on the basis of first ground rules, second ground rules, third ground rules. Although humanitarian organizations could choose to negotiate with the SPLM and these other groups outside of OLS, relatively few did. And this ensured a level of coherence in assistance and protection and leverage from principles were violated that at the time was unprecedented. Now, the second type of negotiation are what are called emergency response plans. And by the mid-1990s, so five years after the end of the Cold War, many humanitarian country teams, in fact, more than 50% of all of the HCTs at the time were using the framework established by ERPs to set the terms and conditions for humanitarian action in a country on a 12-month period. ERPs were for one year. They were far less formal than the signed access frameworks. So a sign a framework, an access framework, is actually signed by a party. ERPs were not. They were less formal. They had the advantage of structuring relations with the non-state armed group by setting out in detail the actual modalities, the machinery of humanitarian action. They spelled out how assessments would be done, the methodology. They spelled out the mechanisms for delivery, and they sell, spelled out protocols for monitoring. So if you look at the evolution, you have an access framework, which is a broad commitment, formally signed. You move to an ERP, which has detailed modalities for the actual components of what you're doing, and it's less formal. The shift from access frameworks to the ERPs was driven, at least in part, 
by concerns that formal agreements like OLS and the ground rules conferred legitimacy on the non-state armed groups and pulled humanitarians into the political orbit of those groups. ERPs, on the other hand, avoided this risk by being fully and only humanitarian in character. A particularly good example, the textbook example of the ERP approach was, of course, in Angola, where the UN, on behalf of humanitarians, negotiated ERPs on an annual basis with the government of Angola on the one hand and with UNITA, the main non-state armed group in the country, on the other. Angola's ERPs included fully structured access protocols. People who study access protocols, that's your textbook. They defined the types of protection and assistance and the conditions under which they would be delivered. Very interestingly, small teams of humanitarian negotiators working on behalf of the humanitarian country team were deployed directly into conflict areas, engaging directly with commanders on the ground to ensure that the modalities in that ERP were respected. So you had an ERP, it said this is how assessments are gonna be done, and you had teams of humanitarian negotiators on the lines with the commander saying, it's in the ERP. This is what you have to do. These teams were fully accepted as neutral actors by all parties, and they were empowered to negotiate cross-line convoys. Here's the government. Here's UNITA. They were on the line negotiating cross-line convoys. Who does that now? And cross-line corridors replacing the chaotic and unsuccessful attempts of individual organizations to negotiate access with UNITA. The third category of negotiations are joint operating principles. These are informal statements. They often include a combination of intention, of aspiration, and affirmations of broad principles. They are only, in fact, rarely the result of direct negotiations with belligerents. Much more often, they are based on consultations between humanitarians. Humanitarians draft these things. Worse examples are when the IASC gets involved with it. When you have the IASC in headquarters drafting a joint a set of joint operating principles for a country somewhere else. After those negotiations are done, then someone goes and presents these to the belligerents. That's not negotiations, that's a fait accompli. Now, JOPs are increasingly popular, not least because they're relatively easy to elaborate. They do not require the skills necessary to negotiate with sophisticated senior belligerent leaders. And here's the worst part of a JOP. They exercise little, in fact, basically no pressure on the belligerents. In many contexts, however, humanitarians feel that JOPs are the most pragmatic form of engagement now with the non-state actor, even if they produce suboptimal results. The Democratic Republic of Congo illustrates this well. The UN estimates right now there are more than 100 different armed groups that are operating in the DRC, many of whom have unclear, if any, political aims, and many have open or clandestine relationships with national actors. Humanitarians have a very difficult time dealing with the opaque nature of these groups, their highly localized presence, the lack of unified command, and legendary ill discipline. Although efforts have been made to structure relations with these multiplicity of non-state armed groups, the reality, for those of us who have worked in Congo, is that even when they are in place, access remains highly restricted. 
and it requires exhaustive negotiations with low-level commanders in every single village. If you're lucky enough to get an agreement with one of those commanders, they are almost always repudiated when a new commander comes in. A fourth relatively new form of engagement with non-state armed groups are risk frameworks. These are difficult to put in place and very difficult to negotiate. But humanitarians have started to use these in situations where a non-state armed group is in effect a state actor. This is currently the case in Afghanistan and of course in Yemen. Both countries face some of the world's worst humanitarian conditions and in both countries humanitarians are forced to engage with non-state authorities who see themselves as sovereign and for all intents and purposes exercise full sovereign power but are not recognized as being legitimately sovereign by anybody else. Risk frameworks are real-time accountability mechanisms that are used to modulate the flow of assistance to reflect the real-time actual conditions on the ground. Here's how they work. You establish a clear risk threshold. Humanitarians define those. It's not negotiated. WFP says, if this threshold is breached, we cannot deliver food assistance. When a threshold is breached, assistance is ramped down till you reach an acceptable level of risk. Now that ramping down, is, step is taken immediately when a risk threshold is breached. Hard part comes in when you're renegotiating the steps you do this with the belligerents to get the risk level to an acceptable higher level so that you can ramp up assistance. Now, this is not a one-way street. There are steps that a belligerent can take to reach an acceptable risk level. There are steps humanitarians can take. It's shared accountability. Now once you get back to an acceptable level, up goes the assistance. So assistance is modulated based on acceptable levels of risk. Now these require very high order, extremely sophisticated negotiations. It's a skill set many humanitarians, let's be honest about ourselves, really don't have. This is where you want your trade negotiators in there. Why? Because you first have to explain to the belligerents what the risk threshold is. Not exactly a straightforward conversation. And then when that threshold is breached, the negotiations become very tricky because the belligerents are going to say, humanitarians, you take the steps that are necessary to get to an acceptable level. We're saying to the belligerents, you take those steps. And the point is, we both have to find a way to do that. As you would imagine, the pressure on the humanitarians by a non-state armed group, which is a, all intents and purposes sovereign, are extreme. That's what I'm saying. You've got to really know what you're doing. Because you essentially have a non-state armed group with full state authority negotiating with you. What I'd like to do now is shift and reflect on four of the many perils humanitarians face when they engage with non-state armed groups. The first peril is the legitimization of armed groups. Sometimes this legitimization comes in the form of giving the armed group international visibility and informal recognition by virtue of the fact that negotiations are even occurring with them. Other times it occurs when the armed group takes credit for delivering help to people, solidifying a social compact with the communities they control. 
An example of the first is OLS, which contributed to the SPLM, evolving from being localized bands of armed rebels into a structure capacitated, internationally recognized liberation movement that successfully divided Africa's largest country into two states, one of which they took control over. An example of the second is Yemen. At the height of the world's worst famine, Ansarala demanded that food assistance be delivered through its Ministry of Education. Although WFP put in place mechanisms to try and limit diversion and ensure that the aid reached children in need, Ansarala falsely announced that these were their deliveries through their Ministry of Education. They lied to the population about mistakes that WFP was making, saying WFP isn't delivering to you directly. We are, through our Ministry of Education. And they claimed credit for a political promise they had made to the population to deliver free school meals, something the population had been demanding for years. The second peril in negotiating with non-state armed groups is violating the principle of neutrality. This includes building the administrative capacity of a non-state armed group in the expectation that it will do a better job of coordinating with us. An example of this, as we talked about, are the ground rules that were negotiated with the SPLM, which included training on the administrative functions that could be used to increase the overall effectiveness of their military campaign. The third peril is the risk of politicizing humanitarian assistance. This is a very common problem, particularly in UN special and peacekeeping missions, where senior UN political officials negotiate humanitarian corridors and ceasefires as confidence-building measures between rebels and state actors. As soon as the special representative says to the humanitarians, don't you think it's a good idea for us to build confidence through a humanitarian gesture? No, it's not. It means they're not good enough to do their job, to get those belligerents to agree to the political conditions for ending hostilities. They piggyback on the humanitarians. Now. These efforts are very often praised for laying the groundwork for political negotiations. Listen to what's said in the UN Security Council. You will hear this on a regular basis. But the reality is that a political negotiator is using humanitarian assistance to advance a political agenda. This happens a lot. In Yemen, for example, the UN's envoy, he is now, I point this gently, the head of humanitarian action for the United States. I'm talking about the same person. He's a friend. He negotiated a humanitarian ceasefire in the port of Hudeida as a confidence building measure between the parties. Now that ceasefire broke down very quickly. And when it did, humanitarians were denied access to essential humanitarian infrastructure in the ceasefire zone. Breaks down, we can't get there anymore. Those were the Red Sea mills, and we depended on them to get food to people who were going to die in the famine if we did it. This was done in retaliation by Ansarala for the political actions of the other party. Fourth peril derives from the very nature of non-state actors. By definition, non-state armed groups operate beyond the rule of law. This means that they frequently undervalue or violate commitments they have entered into. There's the additional problem that a number of non-state armed groups are listed under anti-terrorist legislation, opening humanitarian negotiators to prosecution unless waivers are obtained. We also should be absolutely clear that the aims of non-state armed groups are rarely aligned with humanitarian aims, making engagement with them adversarial in nature. Non-state armed groups want to control and profit from humanitarian aid and to use it for their own advantage. They want to profit from humanitarian assistance, 
not to ensure that it reaches people on the basis of principles that they themselves may not necessarily ascribe to. Humanitarians, on the other hand, want unimpeded access. We want non-interference. We want respect for those international principles and international humanitarian law. In reality, neither party usually gets what they want, and you end up with a negotiated compromise. To ensure that that negotiated outcome favors humanitarians, engagement with the groups has to be strategic, planned, disciplined, and it's got to be principled. And the question is, how do you do that? I think there are multiple types of frameworks that engage and bind non-state actors. We've just talked about four of them. But what is key to the success of negotiating, whether it's an access framework, whether it's a joint operating principle, or whether it's a risk framework, what is key is an empowered humanitarian coordinator. These are negotiators who represent the entire humanitarian community. They ensure cohesion within that community. And here's the key point. They are authorized to leverage the bargaining power of that community during negotiations with the non-state armed group. That minimizes the risk that a non-state armed group can divide and instrumentalize individual humanitarian organizations. That's why you want an empowered coordinator. Empowered coordinators, however, are only as strong as the secretariats that support them. For many years, OCHA performed that role. And before OCHA, for those of us who are of an elderly age, it was the Department of Humanitarian Assistance, DHA. Several years ago, as we all know, OCHA offices were realigned to become a staff function of the emergency response coordinator in New York. OCHA field teams shifted from defending humanitarian action in support of their humanitarian country team to focusing on procedural and transactional headquarters priorities. This was regrettable and can hopefully be changed. Two final thoughts. For many years, humanitarian engagement has been shaped by a relatively small group of activist organizations that have benefited not from universal acceptance of IHL, but from the strong support of leading countries in the United Nations. And not even the preponderance of countries, quite a small group of them. With the balance of global power now changing, we should be ready for new perspectives on how humanitarian principles are shaped and defended and actualized across the world this little club that we've been in. A stranger. Already, for example, we see efforts to embed concepts of non-interference as a form of neutrality into humanitarian frameworks. I think everyone knows what I'm talking about here. You've got a major global power who says neutrality is, in fact, non-interference. Now, humanitarians, by definition, show up in someone else's country and say, we're actually going to do things in your country. Don't worry, it's on the basis of principles. That's what we call neutrality. No, no, something else is going on here. You have a major global power that says neutrality is, in fact, non-interference. If you're not worried about that, start to panic. The humanitarian stakes are very high, as we all know. In less than two years, 500,000 people are estimated to have died in the conflict in Tigray. Now, organizations which track this estimate that 300,000 of the 500,000 people who died died because they didn't have us. They didn't have humanitarian assistance. 
Despite the best efforts of the teams on the ground, none of the existing humanitarian, diplomatic, or economic tools, we all tell ourselves we have lots of tools, they were all applied in Tigray, and none of them resulted in predictable access. So of course the tragedy in Tigray is gonna become the norm unless we figure out how to adapt our engagement strategies to fit the new realities in a very different balance of global power. I'd like to thank the Center for Strategic International Studies, USAID, and the Norwegian Refugee Council for allowing me to share these thoughts with you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. That was absolutely eye-opening and really incredible discussion. I learned a lot. And I want to kind of dig into some of the things that you um, brought up during the conversation. And I have a couple that are, uh, you know, a little bit tangential, but I think also uh, could lead a little bit to some more clarity in some areas. And uh, the first question I have is a little bit practical. Uh, and so you spoke to, you know, in the negotiations, the shifting platform and different players. So what does that negotiation look like? How do you structure how you engage? And, you know, I'm presuming it, it, it requires a lot of agility and adaptability to, uh, you know, changing circumstances. But to that end also, then what does the accountability structure look like? in that type of environment? So, you know, there are a number of very useful manuals. OCHA produces them, a number of uh, humanitarian organizations do. ICRC probably has the best one that suggests how you negotiate. So as one of the uh, long-lasting negotiators in the UN on humanitarian assistance, I've read all of them. And frankly, I'm not sure I would have known what to do if that resource had been uh, the only inputs I had. So I think the key, frankly, to uh, humanitarian negotiation is knowing how to negotiate on your back foot. So when you go into negotiations as a humanitarian, you really don't have a lot of leverage or power. You have the most power if there is a major member state that has a lot of influence over the non-state armed groups. That's really where your leverage comes from. You have additional leverage if the humanitarian community, sans ICRC, because they're never part of it, if they're basically with you, you've got more leverage. But even in those situations, you're still on your back foot. You are guests in these countries. You have a status which is based on an abstract principle, but depends upon them legally allowing you to be there. So the best negotiators are those who know how to negotiate from a position of weakness. So if I were running a humanitarian organization, I'd call the trade unions. Trade union negotiators, almost always, are negotiating from a position of weakness vis-a-vis -vis management. When I first started coming up through the UN, there was a small group of we were all in DHA at the time, of frontline humanitarian negotiators. There were 13 of us, seven of us came from the unions. So I think that in addition to all the manuals that are helpful for setting guidelines, the real issue is can you leverage what leverage may be there, whether it's a member state or the cohesion of the international community, and can you negotiate from a position of weakness. And if you can do that, you're probably going to be better off than if you don't. What doesn't work is if you come from a very rich country 
and you just think if you show up and you tell the non-state armed groups to do something, that they will miraculously understand that they're supposed to and do it. That doesn't work. Look at the profile of many humanitarian coordinators and the point rests. So, in addition to the work you have to do in country, there are a number of external forces putting pressure on the means and the how and the why. So, what are the means for navigating that type of pressure, be it political, it's donor objections, and even multilateral and unilateral sanctions? That's why you need a good OCHA. That's why you need an OCHA team that works for the HCT. Because who really handles most of that pressure, keeps track of it, negotiates it, sets it to right, are the OCHA teams. What really dealt a knockout blow to much of the humanitarian negotiation that was going on through the early knots and the mid knots was when OCHA shifted. Because the humanitarian coordinator can't do all of that. Not a chance. It's got to be the OCHA teams that do that. But if the OCHA team is focused on what's, you know, these transactional, procedural, there are a lot of people glaring at me, you must all work for OCHA. Um, if you're all focused on those, then you're not supporting your HC on the, well, more importantly, your HCT on the ground. That makes sense. Um, so I want to go back to this discussion on legitimization, uh, particularly if you're looking at an ends uh, focus rather than the means. And you, know, you spoke about the work in Sudan specifically. So as I'm listening to this, I'm wondering, is there a bright line for that type of support? Does it depend on the, the non-state actor? And then, so yeah, I want to ask about that first, and I have kind of a follow-on question to that. So non-state armed groups that have aspirations for international visibility, legitimization, and um, an expectation that they could take, um, that they could play a political, a recognized political role in their country, if not control the country, watch out. Be very aware. You know, in a case like Congo, where you have a hundred armed groups, many of which do not have clear political aims. It's a different situation than where you had an SPLM that said, we want the country to break up and we want our own. In a situation like that, any step you take, keep your eyes wide open for the risk of legitimizing those claims through humanitarian action. If you want to legitimate them politically, don't be a humanitarian. I mean, there's an argument to do that. Just don't pretend you're a humanitarian. But if you want to maintain humanitarian integrity, then you've got to draw that line between them. You know, the reason that as soon as the ground rules were signed with the SPLM, Riyak Machar, who at the time had broken off from the SPLM and was running SSIM, he said, oh, I want one of those ground rules agreements because this would, of course, give his movement the visibility that he craved to advance his political agenda. And then Lam McCall, you know, as soon as the ink was dry on the second agreement, said, actually, I'm going to splinter off from SPLM because I'm very angry at John Garang. I'm going to create SPLM United, and I want that visibility that the ground rules give. So I think in a situation where the political aims of the non-state armed group are explicitly statehood in nature, you know, proceed with due caution. In the case of Congo, it's different. Many of those organizations, if not the majority, do not have the same kind of clear state-directed ambitions. And then um, just a final question before we, we open it up to the audience for questions. I'm just curious. To you, what does success look like? And is that you know, a ta-da moment, or is it more of a way to measure um, incrementally what you want these outcomes to achieve over time? So the, the point about success in a humanitarian context is that 
uh, you are constantly able, in a principled way, to get assistance to people who aren't going to make it without you. That's your job. And you have success measured every day on whether you succeed in doing that or not. Success never comes in the form of we've reached an agreement on an access framework, done. Never. So that's step one. And then every day in every location where there are people who need assistance in order to survive, you have to make sure that it reaches the people in need in a timely fashion so they make it to the next day. So success is, in fact, not punctual. It is a continual commitment to upholding a set of principles under the most unimaginable conditions. Because if we fail, then people die, as we saw in the case of Tigray. Stakes are very high. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and open up the floor for questions. There should be um, microphones or speak in a commanding voice. If you work for OCHA, you're not allowed to ask me anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a gentleman right there next to you. Please. Hi. Um, well, first of all, thanks for your opening comments. Um, I mean, they are clearly built on years of experience, and I really appreciated uh, your candor and your honesty. I fully agree um, of the role of an empowered HC. You were an empowered HC. I think rather than being given the power, you took the power um, uh, very clearly, certainly in South Sudan, in Yemen, and places like that. Uh, and also on negotiations. Also, I think you touched on something. I was part of the mission that went into Haiti recently, uh, the EDG, looking at what could be done in relation to, um, in a political vacuum, but where ganglands are basically running, uh, not just the city, but uh, the wider part of the country. And a key issue came up was this um, issue of legitimization and also the fact that the gangs were using whatever assistance was coming in to say to the communities, you see how we are the ones. So they have a political agenda. It's a very confused agenda, but they have that. I, I guess I'm coming to the question in some ways. The three key things I think that were essential were <clears throat> to try and integrate protection, which is a major issue in there, with service delivery, okay? Um, which certainly Concern is doing because doing protection on its own uh, is probably not viable. But the second and the more hot topic was around the word of negotiation with gangs for entry. The HC in there had refused, my understanding, to negotiate directly for fear of legitimization, but encourage negotiation uh, through at uh, different levels yeah. uh, within that. Um, and that seemed to be successful up to a point. But I guess um, I'm curious to know at the political level, there, there has been no response from the Security Council in relation to this international specialized force that was asked for. And, and no response is, is probably worse than a no. Um, and there's a big debate going on about whether we should be strengthening the national police. Uh, nobody wants to go back to peace building. Um, there's other issues around trying to control the arms flow, some of which is coming in from the US, at least trying to tackle that. But where do you put diplomacy and the external diplomacy, which seems to be on the win, as part of your negotiations as a contributing factor. Um, I'm not seeing in the last number of years that diplomacy has the same robust uh, attention um, that has been given. And it's the one thing that didn't seem to get discussed around international diplomacy. The last point I'll make is I just, you know, we had two presidents in Northern Ireland where I'm from. Uh, visiting for a population of 1.4 million uh, to mark the 25 years of the peace agreement. That's an extraordinary amount of attention for a very small conflict, which does indicate that that level of attention is required elsewhere. But the three things that contributed to that were external engagement, US included, the engagement of local groups, community groups, and the third and critical one was having women at the negotiation table. Um, so back into the diplomacy question, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that can fold into your negotiation strategy. Um, so when humanitarians 
coordinators themselves get together and they're you know, trying to explain to each other what they should be doing. Uh, the piece of advice is know the strong member state that has control over your belligerence. And develop a deep and meaningful relationship with that member state. So if you're in CAR, have the telephone numbers for Paris. When we were in South Sudan together, we had the telephone numbers of Addis and Washington. Because what you did was you called them and you said, I'm really stuck and they're stealing all of WFP's food and can you call someone and you know, help us out here and make it clear that that's got to stop. When you get to a place like Yemen or you're in um, Kabul right now, who, who do you call? And as we see the fragmentation of the global good, which is peace and security, which, I mean, for Frank, was an American contribution through overwhelming military superiority in every single weapon system in every single domain. Right? That global good set some pretty strong parameters that allowed a handful of countries for the last 80 years to exert disproportionate influence on other actors. That's all breaking down. And I think we have to face the fact that not only are we going to have a lot more Afghanistans and Yemens, where you just don't have anyone to call that's prepared to exercise influence, it will also mean that a number of actors whose decisions about how they were behaved were shaped by the global good which was a framework for peace and security provided and paid for by the United States of America, when that no longer is the sine qua non upon which all of this is based, boy, you could have a whole lot of actors behaving in a way like we're seeing in um, parts of the Sahel that you mentioned Haiti, a very specific case of where you have a complete breakdown of state authority in a context of regional realignment. I think we have to be prepared for the fact that that's probably the new norm. The role of diplomacy, is it diplomacy or pressure? Because the example I gave you was pressure. All right, a member state calls CAR, calls Bangui, and says, I'm not sure that's quite diplomacy, but it was certainly the basis upon which many operations of our generation depended. Do you believe there is um, a genuine intent within the humanitarian community to achieve the quality of um, access, humanitarian structure that you've defined in your remarks um, that would allow us to negotiate for um, uh, humanitarian access? And if not, are we more focused on other things like competition with each other for funds, et cetera? Um, and if so, how do we hold ourselves accountable for that? One of the um, very interesting features of the early negotiated access frameworks was they did not assume that humanitarians on their own acted in a neutral way. And the belligerents said, if we're going to give you unhindered access, then we want guarantees, promises that you're going to behave a certain way. And of course, that's now petered off. You almost never see this anymore, where humanitarians will be very clear about the commitments and promises that they made and how they will actualize them. In terms of um, do I think that there's a commitment to um, humanitarian access, not a doubt in my mind that there is. There wasn't a single operation that I worked on in 12, in 12 wars in 25 years where that wasn't there. I think what we're all struggling with is a structure of formation that allows us to work in the most leveraged way to ensure those principles are there. I feel that the discussion about competition, it's always tactical, you're always trying to get more money. But in terms of a level of shared purpose, shared intent and cooperation, it's pretty exceptional. 
one over here. Um, okay, we'll go from here then. Right here. Right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. I, it was enlightening. It was reflective of experiences that I've also had in certain ways, not in Africa, but in, in, in Latin America, Central America. No, I'm not from OCHA. I'm from UNHCR. That's different. <laughs> we, we, we had a very- We might have a shared view of OCHA. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we might. <laughs> but it depends on which part of OCHA when and of under course, which circumstances. Of course. But in any case, UNHCR does have a clear uh, mission and that's what UNHCR does, and it, it makes it much easier to know what to yeah. do, yeah. to be sure. But it, the problem that I, at least that it, it affected me, and I'll speak of two countries, one is El Salvador, the other is Colombia. Yeah. Uh, in both instances, you had armed groups that controlled parts of the country. The government was simply not present. They didn't dare to be present because they had been lost that part of the country. And on the other hand, you had in that you had in the US at least and in many of the countries of the developed world groups of people who were totally in love with the armed groups that were fighting in the case of El Salvador it was it was the um, FMLN in the case of Colombia the FARC and these were these were the heroes and these were the people that were going to win and we'll do everything we can to make them win which made them enemies of the UN humanitarian action and the enemy of many of the humanitarian groups that were trying to be instrumental in solving the situation. And I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to frame a question out of that, but it was certainly a dilemma, having been, having been told that, uh, having been considered persona non grata by many of the people I thought should be allies. But there are ways around it. There are ways of negotiating with them. How does one deal with the, with the propaganda, not negotiation, that get in the way, gets in the way of humanitarian action that tries to be um, targeted and even-handed, not neutral, even-handed. Um, so, I used an example in Yemen of where Ansar Allah was lying to it, people that it controlled about what WP was doing. And we had quite a discussion about how to respond to that. Was it of such overriding importance to set the record straight with the population that we would launch a media and engagement campaign for which we had limited resources and limited capabilities because we cared so much about it, we were going to do it anyway and risk um, further retaliation from Ansarala over that issue or were we, were we not? And you know, as I said, we're, these, many of these negotiations are by definition adversarial in nature. The aims of the non-state armed group and the aims of humanitarians almost never coincide. So if you go into negotiations going, right, this is adversarial, then you're gonna end up in a situation where you're continually trying to find a solution that favors you. <laughs> and in order to favor humanitarians in that situation, we did not spend uh, treasure and time in trying to tell the population what the truth was about the situation. That's a judgment call. It may have been a wrong one. Um, I think the key throughput in this is the constant question you have to ask yourself. In this negotiation of an adversarial nature, what can I do that continually tilts the favor to humanitarian access. And if that becomes your compass point, probably the best basis to make the decisions and compromises that by definition you're forced to make. All right, um, chartreuse and then this. <laughs> Hi, sorry, I'll stand so you can see me. Um, thank you so much for this discussion and those remarks. I have a question. Um, about the future. So I do a lot of work in Afghanistan and uh -huh. in Somalia, right? And I've just come from Afghanistan where I was doing a study on sort of principled humanitarian access at the worst possible time uh, one can remember in Afghanistan. And part of the frus my frustration in watching this is I talk to aid workers on the ground who 
maybe they didn't know neutrality by its name, but they were trying to be neutral, trying to get food to those who needed it most, et cetera, et cetera. But above them, above that frontline level, there's very little capacity to support that. There have been trainings and workshops and so many efforts, but the kind of, for better or worse, the OLS type capacity, the real political, I mean, for lack of a better term, at that level. Um, of, course you, of course you have HCs, but they're hostage to the will of agencies and, and, and all sorts of things. And so in Somalia as well, it's a very different context tough negotiations, a tough armed group to negotiate with. But my, my sense is that in both of these contexts, with a different system, with a different structure, with a different setup, much, much more can be done. Red lines, JOPs, they don't work for these kinds of contexts. Not in the way, uh, not, they're not sufficient on their own. I shouldn't be too hard on them. But my question to you is, in light of these kinds of contexts and where things are likely to be headed, which you already touched on, they're gonna to get tougher. If I gave you a magic wand, what would you, <laughs> what kind of system, what kind of structures at that high level, at the level at which you've operated, how would you build things differently? What do we need to prepare? What would we, what should we be investing in? Hmm. You know, one of the extraordinary things about Operation Lifeline Sudan is that it was actually negotiated by the head of one UN agency. It was Jim Grant from UNICEF. He was, of course, outside of the country, which addresses the point that you're raising about the tsunami-like pressure that's on an HC. Um, clearly represented the center of gravity of the international community and was able to persuade in the middle of a famine the belligerents that this is what the guardrails look like. Um, I think there's really a role for that. And I think that the emergency um, response coordinator in New York, um, the head of the World Food Program, the head of UNICEF, the head of UNHCR, these are extraordinary colleagues with extraordinary capabilities that could be called upon to play this role in contexts like Somalia. So that the HC, um, who has very little maneuverability politically, gets the space, or in fact shares the responsibility with someone from HQ. I think that probably is going to be much more likely, or much more common than it has been for the past 10 years. It's also very important that we rethink two decisions that have been made recently through the IAC processes. One, to move back from L3s. You know, a level three humanitarian coordinator was a designation that was given to people who were in a situation like Somalia. It was a designation given to someone who was in Kabul. So we've backed off from that. And I think that's a decision that the IASC could usefully revisit. And then the issue of the secretariat to the HCT. Who is it that pulls together the enormous amount of work that's required to keep these operations going, the role of OCHA? I think it's absolutely worthwhile for the IASC to rethink that and quite frankly to uh, renegotiate that arrangement. I think those are three parts of the structure that can, each of those is quite easy to do. They don't require an entire existential shift of humanitarian action. All right, so, I mean, we can all engage in the existential shift in humanitarian action, but that's a very confusing process, a very time-consuming process with a very unpredictable outcome. Right, the outcome could be far worse than what we currently have. What I described are things that can be done really within the existing structure and, and arguably quite quickly. And that might reinforce the ability of our leadership to, to do what's necessary. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me. Mm -hmm. So first of all, thank you very much for your, uh, for your words. I think uh, for me it was very, inspiring and it's good that you let's say look back 
a bit of a history because the humanitarians we tend to forget and we tend to create uh, new tools believing that we are the only ones uh, having the great idea and uh, to be frank I was not really aware of all these tools uh, that were developed uh, since the mid 90s. Um, so my name is Hisham Khadarawi, I'm the director of operations of Geneva Call. We are an NGO that is basically uh, doing what you've just been describing, trying to engage armed groups and uh, securing humanitarian commitments. Um, and I just wanted to, to raise three really quick points. The first one, you, I mean, you described, I would say, a romantic role of HCs that unfortunately may not exist anymore. Yeah. I mean, the HC that you described are the textbook HCs or the ones that maybe you were in Yemen at, or other colleagues that you may know, but today I think we're in a different landscape. Um, I was invited at uh, the HC retreat in Montreux, um, and they invited me to speak about armed groups engagement and negotiations and so on and so forth. And I was um, surprised, to say the least, to see uh, the little reaction or the little, let's say, appetite uh, to develop this type of you know, engagement with armed groups. I saw in some of the HCs, no, no need to, to, to name anyone, a, a reluctance uh, based on fear and lack of knowledge. And um, this was for me a bit striking because we speak about uh, the top, uh, let's say, UN positions in a given country. So I, I think there is, there is something to do. I mean, you talk about this small group that was, de was developed in 90s or early 2000s, I don't know. And I think something that needs to be developed uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, my second point is, um, there are still a lot of initiatives that are developed by NGOs like us, but any, many others, and especially by non-traditional actors, uh, elders, religious leaders, people that have vested interest in a given community right. that develop dozens of, let's say, agreements that can be informal, that can be in the verses of Quran, in uh, the prayer, uh, the prayer, uh, let's say, speeches on Friday or anything. And this should not be overlooked because we may have these uh, uh, top strategic agreements that were developed, the ones that you described, but at the end of the day on the ground, these type of actions uh, are working not maybe at the strategic level, but they are the ones enabling, let's say, access for populations and not for humanitarian actors. Mm -hmm. I repeat this in many panels where I am, we are not here to secure access for us, but to secure access for people to the basic services. I think this is for me an, an important uh, aspect. So I think it would be interesting to have more inclusivity as well and uh, localization uh, efforts to, 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 uh, to, let's say, have more analysis with, with, uh, from, from all these, act, um, let's say, actions that have been done at local level. And my last point, I loved your point about um, the piggyback from political negotiators using humanitarian negotiations. I was in Brussels uh, forum uh, last month, and this was said by top leaders in the UN, and I was a bit shocked. So I'm very happy to hear you uh, saying that. Thank you very much. Um, so, the insight that you had about um, a humanitarian coordinator who is also responsible for a number of other functions in a country, this of course was part of the drive to separate the HC functions from other responsibilities at the top level. Um, most of us who were HCs really didn't want that. And the reason we didn't want that is because when you're negotiating with belligerents, um, what they really paid attention to was your UNDP function. All right, and you know, the thing that really killed the um, stature and leverage of the humanitarian coordinator was the RC reform, which separated the RC function from the HC. That's part of the reason why uh, you, you see what you see. Um, on the question of, of how you get good HCs, um, a lot of this, of course, has to do with the way in which the UN leadership understands that role. So when you have UN leadership that understands that role as X, well, the people that get appointed look like X. 
And if you and leadership understands it as why, transactional procedural, then it looks like why. So the real issue here is how do the member states communicate to the Secretariat of the UN, this is what that role should look like, and then it follows from there. Now, what you were describing um, about the role of um, the business community, the church, tribal leaders, in creating, um, and you put it very well, the reality of assistance and protection, not necessarily of how the club defines that. Um, so, of course, this is very similar to the arguments that you're seeing across the UN on networked multilateralism, right, where you'll have networks of other actors that become part of a broad effort. Um, I think that as global power changes, I think what you're describing is going to be a model that um, other global leaders than the ones right now are very interested in, and I've heard them say such. So I think you are prescient about where the discussion is going. Now, for the, the Jesuits amongst us, those of us who say we're humanitarians, who hold the doctrine, who defend that doctrine, this might be very uncomfortable. <laughs> right? Right? But I think it is almost certainly um, the wave of the future. Well, thank you. I, I deeply apologize. We have no more time for questions and to the online viewers. I also apologize we did not get to your questions, but thank you, Lise, so thank you. much for your time, for this incredible discussion, and I'm sure you've left everyone with a lot to think about and a lot to discuss.